Again, it is James chapter 1, verse 27. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. All right, what a joy it is to be with you, as it always is, when we get to open up God's Word together. Um, Before we get into James, just uh, one thing I wanted to make you aware of. You had this in your seat. Uh, It's kind of a save-the-date invitation, if you will, to Paradox Justice Conference, as you can see, July 20th. Uh, 9 to 2, so it's a couple months from now, but we wanted to get you this as uh, we talk about justice over these last three weeks that at this conference, well, let me just say a couple things. One, I don't know if many of you realize like how blessed we are at the Paradox with people that go here that are just kind of experts in the fields that we've been talking about over the last few weeks, that they, they have they given their lives over uh, to seeing justice brought forth in Fort Worth like through nonprofits and through organizations and through their lives. And so this conference is putting those people before you, putting those people before us. So folks like us that are trying to figure this out or how can I be involved, what can I do, uh, that they can serve us and help us in that way. So from people that um, are, maybe you're knee deep in this work and you're all about this, uh, this conference will serve you or you're like have no idea where to start or what to do or if this is for you, this conference will expose you to opportunities uh, that will help you um, know how God might be calling you to uh, be a part of uh, bringing forth justice in the midst of uh, Fort Worth. So I would encourage you, uh, be on the lookout for more information that's actually already on the website. You can go ahead and go and register for it, um, and uh, it'll, be, it'll be a great time. It'll be well worth your time. You won't regret it, so I would encourage you to do that. Uh, let me, oh yeah, one other thing. The table in the lobby is for that, so you can go to the table in the lobby after the service. You can just write down your email, um, and then we'll get back to you with information on the conference or any other information that you want, uh, and talk to us about how, what City Renewal looks like here at the Paradox. Um, so let me pray for us, and then we'll hop into James. Uh, Father, we uh, just come to you and ask for you to send your spirit uh, in a way that would help us understand uh, what your word has to tell us today. Uh, Holy Spirit, as we uh, think about you coming and ministering to us this morning, we realize that you inspired these words and you mean them for us. That thousands of years ago you meant them and, and, and now even today that, that you're, you're alive and you're working and this word is alive as you use it and apply it to our hearts. And so Spirit, would you do that for each one of us here today? That you would help us understand uh, what you have for us and how in particular you want us to uh, visit the orphan in their affliction. Uh, that we wouldn't be overwhelmed by that thought, but that we would seek you in the midst of that thought. Um, We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to start by talking about a recent interaction I had. Um, uh, Let me start by this. This is kind of a heavy example. So there you go. Um, Now, that was the only light part of this example. Um, So, but I was talking to someone, it was a few months ago, and I was talking about uh, the realities of abortion. Um, And they were talking about um, some of the reasons people would have an abortion and whatnot. And then Tim Tebow came up, they brought, they were reading his biography and I guess uh, this is what they said that in his biography, it says that his parents um, f- heard when, when they were pregnant with him that he you know, might have some disabilities and be born with uh, disabilities and not be able to do some certain things. Um, and so, but obviously they had him um, and he obviously has every ability. Uh, I forgot about that, <laughs> that light part as well. Um, and, and so the, the, the person I was talking to was just talking about how, man, you know, so many people might do that. They might learn that their child's going to have disabilities and then uh, have an abortion, but then maybe that wasn't the case. Um, and and it, uh, to be honest with you, it just kind of created a pit in my stomach as uh, she was talking about that. And it even does now as I, I tell the story. And I don't know how that affects you, but I'll just say it plainly, like that kind of logic uh, is the exact same kind of logic that leads a place like Iceland 
to abort 100% of their Down syndrome babies. Um, or, uh, or in the states even, that uh, those that are diagnosed with Down syndrome, about 70% are aborted, or in the uh, UK, it's about 90%. Uh, that, that, that same kind of logic that this person was using uh, to kind of support her pro-life, uh, you know, uh, desire, which I share, uh, but it was a very, very faulty logic. Um, and, and it was basically logic based on performance, based on uh, ability. Um, that that, that we, we so often think about um, dignity being associated uh, with someone's ability, Um, And the reality is not any of our dignity is uh, based on our ability to score touchdowns, uh, to make good grades, uh, to be honest with you, to even even be able to form sentences or to walk, that what we could do physically or mentally uh, does not earn our dignity. That, that, That every person that has ever been conceived from a millisecond to 100 years old has dignity because they were created in the image of God. That that, that is where dignity comes from. And and I think so often we think we can like bestow on people dignity and and that is not something we do. We just acknowledge the dignity that is already there because they have been created in the image of God. And so just to say clearly again, people, every one of them, have dignity because they have been created in the image of God. And so in particular, as we're talking about the orphan, when we care for or when we're even welcoming them into our home and we're adopting them, that we're not giving them dignity, but we're acknowledging it. And I think this is precisely why God that, that created all people in his image is calling us to visit orphans in their affliction because he knows the corruption and sinfulness of society one that overlooks people instead of looking to all people. Um, And so as we think about James 1, 27, or 21 through 27, uh, it's gonna gonna help us in a a few uh, particular ways as we look to the orphan and their affliction. One, James is gonna tell us that what we believe actually matters. Um, What we do actually matters. And then what we say matters. So what we believe matters, what we do matters, and what we say matters. And I, I want to talk about some of these individually just for a second because I think, or at least, I think sometimes we can get in little pockets or subcultures that emphasize one of these over the other. And the scriptures just don't do that. They just, they're all uh, important. Like we can get into the what we believe matters where, to be honest with you, in its essence, that is kind of true. Uh, but we get so stuck there in our head that it's more about what we think than what we're actually believing. Uh, and that you're, you're more intellectual, you're more theological, and you're not as concerned with either maybe what you say or what you do. Um, I, I sometimes I think of, uh, I'm not gonna use that example actually. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, be a little self-disciplined there. Um, uh, <laughs> so, so I'm gonna move along and then, uh, so then we can also focus on what we say. I will use this example. I think of like the Christian South or just Southern etiquette. So concerned about what we say, so concerned about how it looks like we're treating people, but often could care less about what we deeply believe and often what we do. But just that we present ourselves in, in a certain way, that we say things that make us look and feel uh, polite, that we have that kind of perception. And then there's the what we do. Uh, people that are just focused on, hey, who, who cares about what we believe? Who cares about what you believe? Who cares about what we say? We need to be about doing all of these things. Um, and typically, I mean, we all judge each other, but I do feel like the doers judge everybody else a little bit more, if I'm honest, um, where they're like, hey, we're about this, and you're not even about it. Why does it even matter what you believe? But again, James, it's, it's just so helpful. The scriptures are so helpful, and they're just all important. Uh, that, that What we believe What we say and what we do, uh, they all matter uh, to Jesus. But I would encourage you, even if you can kind of place yourself in one of those, uh, you can be well-rounded and kind of be in one of those subcultures. So like seminary student, that's who I was thinking of with the first one. So there you go. But so you can be a well-rounded seminary student. Uh, You really can. 
Uh, you can be a well-rounded Southern etiquette kind of person or a, a doer, uh, but, but if you're in one of those cultures, you might just want to humbly consider if you do have some unawareness, and hopefully uh, the Holy Spirit will use James to encourage and convict all of us uh, in that way. So starting in verse 21, uh, James 1, it just says, Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. And so James is just describing the reality of becoming a Christian, talking about what we believe. Um, The reality that we need to put away, as he says it quite simply, all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save our souls. Now, this verse isn't describing, because especially when I think we see filthiness and wickedness, wickedness, and we're okay, we've got to replace, we've got to put those things off and put something else on. And I feel like so often, especially if we're not as familiar with Christians that aren't weird, that we can feel that. Like, we can feel like this is talking about Ned Flanders, which I realize is kind of a dated example, so, like, nobody knows what that means. But, um, so I'll think about it this way. We actually just watched a movie uh, it was called Instant Family. It was about adoption, actually. Is I, I, Okay, someone liked it. It may be a little inappropriate, so I don't know if I can recommend it. But, but either way, they, uh, there was uh, a, like a Christian couple there, and they were just the worst. I mean, it was just, they were so cheesy, so corny. Like it felt, it just felt wrong for them to do that to us. Uh, but... But that's often what culture looks as Christians. And so it's like, oh, they're not filthy or wicked, and they put on this kind of happy-go-lucky, everything's fine. He's talking about the big guy upstairs. That was the line he used. I was like, it's, anyways. And so th- that's not what this verse is talking about. That's not, that's not what, uh, in, a, in a, any real way, what God is calling us to do. But the creator of the universe, the God of the Bible, he, he has realized that there is filthiness and wickedness in us. And what, what the Bible talks about, well, let me just say this, very few people would ever say that they're not things in their life that harm themselves and harm others, that, that they're just quite plainly wrong. And, and they're things that we can't like, help but to do. Like we, we still do them. We know they're wrong. Other people know they're wrong. We see the havoc they cause in our lives and we still seem unable uh, to completely withhold ourselves from them. And that's what the Bible just acknowledges. It calls that sin. Here it calls it filthiness and wickedness. Uh, And so that's what the Bible is saying here, that it's acknowledging that reality and it's saying that God has done something fully and completely for that problem that we all face in Christ. That's what this implanted word is. It says we know we have this need and God has met us in that need with the beauty of his gospel. And again, I want to just reiterate this. What we're receiving is it's not Southern etiquette. It's not receiving some weird Christian subculture. It's not receiving a political agenda, but the gospel. All of those other things were created by men. God created the gospel. It is far above all of those things. And that is what we're called uh, to receive. And receiving the gospel is simply just acknowledging that need that I talked about for everything that God has done for you in Christ his perfect life, his death, his resurrection for the forgiveness of your sins that you might be welcomed in and adopted into this new family. Your soul saved, as it says in James, from an eternity separated from the one who loves you and created you. Just if if you're not a Christian, is there anything that's keeping you from giving your life over towards this God? And even if you look at therefore in verse 21, it kind of harkens back even to verse 18, uh, more than verse 19, where it says, speaking of God, of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And so even for those of you that maybe you're, you're desiring Jesus, you haven't placed your faith in him, but you're desiring him, you can take heart because that is the God of the universe, of his own will, not the God of of America or the 21st century, but the God that stands outside of time, that sees all creation, that God pursuing you, drawing you, knowing that you struggle to, to feel and know that you're loved, and so displaying it so clearly in Christ, that you get to call upon his name and be saved. And then, so 
um, if you aren't a Christian, you know, the call of you is just to place your faith in Christ. Today is the day of salvation. Um, and that's what we would call you to believe. And then for those of us that are Christians, believing this matters because there's no seeking of justice in this world that doesn't include this desire. We need to correct injustice in all spheres, whether people become Christians or not by our efforts. That's just something we need to be about. But in our efforts, if people being reconciled to God is not our heart's desire, then something is off. And so as we're about justice, we're about people being reconciled to their creator. And so two practical implications here. One, we need organizations that do a great job of this. Uh, We need organizations that um, are experts in their field and unapologetically, um, you know, about the gospel. And here's why we need this. One is because many of us are fairly naive. Uh, Many of us are fairly ignorant in regards to what it means to actually serve and care for people well, especially people in vulnerable populations, people that have been overlooked by society. What it actually means, well, let me say it this way, we can actually do more harm than good. That is a real thing that happens. Um, and, and one of the things, like God's grace is not naive. God's grace is wise. God's re- grace is fruitful. God's r- grace is, is helpful towards situations, but we are often naive. And so we need to acknowledge that and we need organizations that kind of help us towards that end. One of them I just think about uh, is the net, one here in Fort Worth that we partner with that is, is these things. They're experts in their field about caring uh, for uh, all kinds of different people and yet they love Jesus and are unapologetic about uh, the hope of the gospel. So that's one. And then two, we also, we need Christian organizations that are about that, but we also need Christians in secular organizations that are doing good work. So there's all kinds of great organizations in Fort Worth that are doing great work, especially in, in regards to uh, the orphan, in regards to uh, caring for friends that struggle with homelessness, and all kinds of different ways. And we need people in those organizations that have this desire to see people reconciled to God, serving and caring for those that are serving alongside you and for the people that you're serving in uh, particular. Um, and so those are two implications as we think about how what we believe actually affects Uh, what we do. And so what we believe uh, deeply uh, matters, but we can't stop there. And and James doesn't. He goes on in verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, And perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. And so what James is quite simply, he's just calling us to obey Jesus. And and he's telling us that if we're not actually doers of the word, we might actually be deceiving ourselves. He says strong, if we're not doers of the word, we are deceiving ourselves. And he uses this great word picture. And I, I think about it, if we were thinking about our life, just imagine that you have like a presentation at work that you're about to give. And this presentation, it's gonna, like if it goes well, you're, they're gonna double your salary, they're gonna give you a beach home, it's just gonna be great. Um, and so you're about to give this presentation, but you're in the bathroom making sure everything's okay. And then you just notice you have this big smudge of ranch from lunch just all over your cheek. Not like a little but just like a big old, I don't know how I got there, don't worry about that, but it's just big smudge of ranch on your cheek. And you, you see it, and then you just completely walk away from the mirror, and you don't do anything. And then you go and give this incredibly important presentation, and nobody pays attention to you because they're distracted by your face. Um, and, and now, none of us would do that. None of us would do that, because we know how important that is to our life. We know how important that presentation is to our life. And so that's that's the very same point that James is making about what God has done on our behalf. That we would look about who he is, look at what he's done, and to walk away unaffected, it's just as silly as walking into that conference room without washing your face off. Um, That's what what James is calling us to uh, in this passage. Um, And then he states really the positive alternative in verse 25, if you see it. That being a doer who acts, and he will be blessed in his doing. 
So simply to do the things that make sense as we respond to God's love for us. To really, because there's a way to over-theologize, wow, that's, there's a, over, a way to over man, there's, yep, okay, we're just going to wait here. Uh, there's a way to look at this too theologically, like the orphan. Um, we need to look at it like that, but then to, like, we often do that with this passage, like, oh, I was an orphan and God saved me, and then yes, and then to not go do anything in response to that, James is saying, well, that's, that doesn't even make sense. How could that be a possibility? Um, he's, he's calling us uh, to act. And so as we talk about justice, I think we have to realize that our, our propensity to do that, that these aren't uh, the, theological truths just meant to be talked about ethereally, but they're meant to impact our day-to-day. Oh, just like the scriptures. There's no theology you'll find in the scriptures that isn't meant to impact your life. None of them were just meant for philosophical discussion. They were meant for the reality of our lives. All of this is meant for the practical theology of living out day to day uh, what God would have for us in the midst of our lives. But then also I feel like we just, as we talk about justice, we can feel led to guilt because we're just really good at feeling guilty. And we feel like even if we're doing something, we're not doing enough. Or if we're not doing anything, we just feel guilty about that. And we need to do more um, and I, I think we have to be, we have to consider that as we think about caring for the orphan, that um, one, we, guilt can kind of get in the way, and I'll, I'll get to that here, here in just a second, but that these truths were meant to affect how we spend our time. They're meant to affect how we spend our money. They're meant to affect the prayers that we pray. Uh, that's what James is talking about here in our text. Um, and then one of the things I think... Um, we do with guilt is it just paralyzes us in this conversation. We're more about managing our guilt in this kind of when, especially when we're talking about caring for uh, the orphan. Um, and I, th- I think some of us are like in this, we get in like this weird form of almost, it almost feels like witchcraft. Like if I, if I just mention this or if I say anything about it, uh, then God's going to call me to something. But if I just don't pay attention to it or if I don't think about it, don't pray about it, don't have to have this conversation, then God's not going to call me to something I'm uncomfortable with. Um, I mean, I was talking to a buddy just this week and he was like, he knew what I was talking about and we were, what we were going to preach about. And he's like, so am I in sin if I don't adopt? And I was like, yep. And then, and then he walked away. And so I think he knew I was joking, but we'll see how it goes. Um, but, but we, we just go straight there. And so we get overwhelmed and we just get paralyzed by the whole thing and, and not uh, really consider the clear call on every Christian's life to visit the orphan and their affliction, whether they're called to adopt or not. Um, and again, I think we're often just afraid God is going to call us to something we can't handle and he's going to threaten our comfort. So whether we're really comfortable and we don't want to lose it or actually comfortable you know, comfort isn't being achieved and we don't want anything, we're fighting so hard to get it that adding something else that's gonna make us uncomfortable is just not even worth pursuing uh, or worth considering. But, but I want us to have this kind of mindset instead. So I want us to have just a large open heart to all God cares about. So if you think about the scriptures, God cares about a whole lot, a whole lot of people, a whole lot of things. God just cares about a whole lot. So we should have a large open heart to all that God cares about as we discern the particulars of what he's calling us to. But he's not, we literally can't, we're finite, we're limited. We cannot do all the things God does. Uh, but God does call us to live these things out in our lives in particular ways. And that's different for me than it is for you. But again, guilt, we got to lay that down. Fear, we have to lay that down. We have to long to be open to all and care about all the things that God cares about, realizing that there might be some really particular ways that I'm going to care, uh, you know, for the orphan in this way or, or, or that way. Um, and so I want us to be uh, willing to do that and, and, and lay our comfort down, lay guilt down just for a moment. I love what, even as we think about just obeying God simply, uh, Charles Spurgeon, a famous 19th century uh, preacher in London, he was saying this about kind of the blessedness of following God in this passage. He says, the blessedness of true religion lies very much in the practical effect of it. Hearing is pleasant, but doing is the effectual proof of grace. That in obeying Jesus, we enjoy his grace. 
And, and so even if you think about these areas that God is, or even visiting the orphan in their affliction, if there's something you're engaged in there and you're not experiencing, I'm not saying easiness, but you're not experiencing any joy, you're not experiencing any, uh, you know, like receiving a God's grace in and through you in those moments, then we should talk about that. Because it should, obeying God should be full of his grace. And again, I'm not saying easy. It actually will be quite uncomfortable. It'll actually probably be incredibly hard. But God's grace is there. Um, and we should enjoy it and embrace it and long for it and see it and feel it in the midst of our obedience, not just what we believe about his grace. Um, and then he goes on, uh, James goes on to, uh, again, what we believe matters, what we do matters, and then what we say matters. Verse 26 if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. I love James, don't you? Just like, okay, I don't want a worthless religion. You don't want a worthless religion. And so quite clearly, we need to, what does it look like to bridle our tongue? What does it look like to, to actually care about what we're saying? What does it look like to actually care about how the words affect people that are around us? And what James is talking about, someone that with a completely unbridled tongue is just someone who doesn't care about any of those things. He doesn't care about the oppression that might be caused uh, by their words. He doesn't care about how other people are cut down by their words. Uh, it's, it's just someone that either subtly or clearly is about puffing themselves up and cutting others down. And, and we can all fall into that kind of temptation in all kinds of different ways. But we should care about how our words affect people. And we can't be perfect, but we should definitely care about how our words affect people that have been marginalized, oppressed, and looked over by society. And we should care because God actually is incredibly intentional about what he says. And he's incredibly intentional about what he says to the marginalized in society. Um, my wife sent me this uh, passage from this book called Thoughts That Make Your Heart Sing. It's by Sally Lloyd-Jones, just a little one-page kind of devotional thing she reads with kids. I'd highly recommend it. It's really, really good. But listen to what this says uh, about how God talks about himself. It says, do you know how God likes to be introduced? His name is the Lord, Father to the fatherless, Defender of the Widows. Our almighty God who sifted stars through his fingers stands not with kings and princes, but with the weak, the powerless, the poor. Because the people no one else thinks are important have a special place in God's heart. He hears their cries, he fights for them, defends them. And one night long ago in Bethlehem, he stepped out of heaven and became one of them. So that's the kind of intentionality that God gives to what he has to say what he has to say to me, what he has to say to you, what he has to say to the people in Fort Worth, in our country, in our world right now that are overlooked by society. And even as that picture of Jesus coming down to not just speak over us, but to be amongst us. And so we might have something to say, but we might not be close enough to anybody to actually say it. And so Jesus was willing to get close to us to communicate what he has to say. We need to go. We need to be willing to, to go to where the marginalized in society are that we might communicate what God has to say to them as he's been so kind to do this to us. And then James 1.27, quite straightforward. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. To visit the orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. It's like, like James is basically saying, hey, what we believe matters, what we uh, do matters, what we say matters. And like, hey, if you're just kind of want like a good example here, th like this is what I'm talking about. And I think sometimes we just over-spiritualize this. Like God has visited us in our orphanness and adopted us into his family. But then he's literally asking us to visit uh, orphans and widows in their affliction. Um, and I think we should consider it in that way. Even during the first service, when we were singing the first song, I, uh, just that one line of, oh God, we need you here. How long will we wait? And I thought, man, that would be the song that I would long for every orphan to sing. 
that, that, that they, they could sing, God, I need you here. How long will I wait? And that we, the church, would be God's answer to that cry. Whether they're crying it or not, whether they're pleading that or not, that's what I long for them to know and believe and plead. And what I long for God to do through us, that we would answer that um, as a church, as uh, God's people. And just to say it quite clearly, not everyone is called to adopt. Many of you shouldn't adopt right now. You're not in a place where that would make sense. Many of you shouldn't foster right now. That's not something that would make sense. But not one of us that are Christians in here get out of this call to care for the orphan. Um, And so we should all consider, okay, what does that look like um, in my life? Uh, And again, not over-spiritualize it. Even just some, some stats. One, there's 32,150 kids in the foster care system in Texas. This is 2017 data. So a couple years old, but roughly, roughly the same. 32,150 uh, kids in the foster care system. And then another uh, census uh, not too long ago, uh, there was about 8 million professing Christians uh, in Texas. So, so however many Christians there actually are, God has called all of those Christians to visit orphans in their affliction. So about 8 million to visit 32,000, uh, to care for 32,000, to know, to pray for, to long, to, to be open to what God might, how my, God might use us. And, um, and I think that should kind of sit on us. That should kind of weigh upon us. I'm not trying to invoke guilt in us, but it's good to, like, how are we doing in that? How are we doing in caring for the 32,000 orphans uh, that are in Texas, that are at least in the system. And there's, you know, obviously more than that in different kinds of ways as we think about, as Jim talked about, the fatherless, the, the, the kids that uh, are in our communities or areas that are just incredibly neglected and underprovided for. Um, and then I think, you know, one of the things that's good to consider is even what is it, what, what comes to mind when we think of orphan? Because there's, there can be kind of this association when we think of uh, someone in the foster system or an orphan, and it's just basically a, a, a baby, just a baby that needs to be adopted. And, and if we think about, you know, populations that are neglected, there's, there's orphans, and then there's the neglected of the neglected. It's basically just school-aged and teenage kids that... Um, uh, yeah, are, that, that either age out of the foster care system or are, are in it for an incredibly extended uh, amount of time. And again, not every one of us is called to adopt one of those kids, uh, but we are called to care for them in one way or another. So let me just think real practically together for a second. What are some ways that God might be calling you? So even, even to think of yourself like you're a single guy, a single uh, woman, what, what God, how might God use you if you don't feel called to uh, adopt right now, don't feel called uh, to foster? One, you could get a job and you can get a job that cares for orphans. You become an attorney that specializes in adoption. You be, could become a social worker that works directly with uh, the orphan. Uh, you could get a job at a nonprofit. There's so many here that are uh, about caring for the orphan uh, in their affliction. Like I said, you could look at uh, Christian organizations. You could look at non-Christian organizations that are doing work, good work and be a part of those organizations. And then quite simply, you can volunteer. Uh, you can volunteer in uh, all of those same organizations um, to, to care uh, for the orphan. There's, there's a very substantive, very helpful, uh, very life-giving for uh, people that you're caring for, the orphan and yourself, opportunities uh, to, to care for the orphan. Um, and again, if you come to that conference in a couple months, we'll, we'll connect you with some of those ones, uh, some of those organizations uh, directly. But then quite plainly, some of us are called to adopt some of us are, or at least need to be open to that reality. Um, I think, again, there's, the, there's people that just feel really guilty and, and feel uh, incredibly, you know, they don't want to uh, consider that because they just feel guilty about not doing it. You just need to lay the guilt down and, and pray and seek God. And then there's some that have shut the door and just know that God's not calling them to do. And I guess a good question is, did God shut that door? Or, or is that just a door that you shut? Um, but some of us should consider, man, what does it look like for us to adopt? Are we in a, we're, is God calling us towards that end uh, right now? Is that something we should start uh, pursuing as we want to uh, care for and visit the orphan in their uh, affliction? And then there's caring for those that have adopted. 
There's caring for those that do foster. There's caring for those that are even kind of knee deep in this volunteer kind of work, um, and they just need someone to talk to. Um, there's there's uh, providing meals for families that have just welcomed someone into their home. Uh, there's there's bringing a meal unexpectedly to a family that has you know brought someone in their home three years ago, and you're just remembering them again. There's a, in your city group talking to people that are involved in this kind of work and asking them just quite simply, how can you pray for them? Uh, and then praying for them in that moment. Uh, there's getting coffee with a friend that um, has adopted or fostered or is volunteering in these ways just to learn more and hear about them and get to know them in this way that you could value this area of their life, that you could see them in this way and kind of affirm and encourage what God is doing. Um, and so I think there's all kinds, and then, then there's just kind of organic ways that we could just have our eyes open for the opportunities that might be before us. And some of this is just really personal to me, just to let you know a little bit about my story. So I actually, I never, um, I never knew my biological dad, um, but throughout the years, uh, I learned that, uh, so when my mom became pregnant, he did leave her money for an abortion. Um, and then there was actually just other uh, family um, pressure. She was a single mom. Had, I had two older, have two older brothers. She had two kids already, and like, could she really care for another kid? And so there was a lot of pressure uh, around her getting an abortion, and it's just something she couldn't go through with. Um, and because of that, I mean, obviously, lots of implications because of that I'm here. Uh, but then, two, like, my my mom got married when I was five, and when I was ten, that gave that because I was there, my, gave my dad the opportunity to adopt me. Um, and so someone who is kind of obviously unknown a lot part of the time kind of lived through some of this and then getting, get, got to enjoy someone being willing to look at me and my affliction, care for me, and uh, call me a son. Um, it's just really encouraging. And that's, those are just opportunities that were before them. And so just organic opportunities that are before you. Who knows about how caring for a single mom might make decisions that she's struggling with all the easier for her? Um, who knows about even, um, yeah, I'll just say, guys, are, are, you, are you single and have you overlooked single moms as someone that you would pursue for marriage? Um, why is that? Um, what, what kind of opportunity, one, to, to be married to a beautiful, godly woman, but then also care for someone uh, that needs care? So just think about and consider, again, having an open heart to all God cares about. As he, as he leads us and guides us by his spirit, as we seek the scriptures and as we pray, as he, as he leads us into what he wants to do, uh, how he wants us to care and visit the orphan uh, in our lives. Um, and then I would say this too. I would say celebrate the ways that you have cared for kids. Celebrate the ways you have cared for the orphan. Because I do think we're so prone to guilt that we forget to celebrate, oh, God's actually given me some opportunities that I've gotten to step into and that I've really seen him work, or it's been hard, but man, just celebrate that. Maybe you've had family members that have been really neglected that you've been able to care for, or maybe even invite into your home. Maybe you have single parents that you really are trying to be really intentional with. Uh, maybe you are a voice for kids that don't have a voice. Uh, celebrate that. Be thankful for those opportunities. Don't just always be consumed with, okay, what more do I need to do? What else is there need to be done? Uh, maybe God's calling you to something else, but take time to share and celebrate and enjoy the opportunities that God has put uh, before you. Sometimes that can really help fight against and war against uh, the guilt that we can be uh, overwhelmed by in our lives. And so in closing, I, I actually just want to speak to the orphan. And there actually might not be one here. There might be. Uh, but I, I would long for what I'm going to say to be the message of the paradox to the orphans and their affliction, to, a, a message in word and deed. So whether you're a little boy or a little girl, a young man or a young woman in their teenage years, these are what I, this is what I want to say to you. One is just quite simply, you You matter. You matter to me, you matter to us, but more importantly, you matter to God. That he looks, he sees, and he knows you deeply. And, and you might have real questions for him about how, why life's been hard, about why you 
have lived a different life than so many others, and there may be many questions that I just wouldn't even have the answers to. But God wants you to know that he says you matter. Maybe you've uh, been told you matter by people close to you, but they've just lived completely differently, showing that their words were just incredibly empty. Maybe you've actually been told you, you don't matter, and, and people have, been, have treated you as less than. Um, or, or maybe you don't know exactly why, but you just feel like that's true of you. You just feel like you don't really matter. But God went through great effort and sacrifice to show you how much you matter. There is no one in your life that has shown greater love or a more clear love than God through all he's done for you in Jesus. So I would encourage you to believe his voice above any other in your life. Let's pray. Father, that your love displayed, it, it is the most beautiful message in the world. And so would you help us believe that? Even now, Spirit, would you, would you help us consider and know and believe what you have done for us? And would you help us, would you, Spirit, would you wash it over us in such a way that, that, that you have um, done this work, a work that we didn't deserve, a work that we couldn't earn, but you have adopted us into your family through your will, through your work, through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Would that, would that truth wash over us in such a way that it actually affects the, what we say and what we do, and in particular, to the orphan? So Spirit, would you lead us now in, in small or large ways to, to celebrate the opportunities you, you've put before us that we've gotten to step into, to seek you in regards to any opportunities you're wanting us to pursue. But Spirit, just keep us from neglecting this clear call on our lives. And in, in the midst of it, would we enjoy and receive your grace again and again. So might the Paradox Church be a church uh, that has a big heart for all that you have a heart for and, and a church that's desiring and willing to answer the clear call you put on our life to, to visit the orphan and their affliction. Help us in Christ's name. Amen.